In this video we'll be going through the 2019 mechanics paper. Okay, so Nicole is playing for her school hockey team. She hits a ball with a velocity of 22 meters per second at an angle of 30 degrees and they've given us a nice little diagram. We're asked in the first question to show that the initial vertical velocity of the ball is 11 meters per second. So we can do that, our vertical initial y velocity, which is the notation I like to use, is equal to 22 sine 30, which if you put into your calculator does indeed give you 11 meters per second. Okay, describe and explain the motion of the ball. You should refer to any forces acting on it as it moves through the air, and you may include a diagram to support your explanation. All right, first of all, the only force acting on the ball once it's in motion is gravity. So the only force on the ball is vertical gravity. The vertical velocity decreases to zero, then increases downward. There are no horizontal forces, so the horizontal velocity does not change. And if we want to do a diagram, we could draw a nice little trajectory and even have a few moments in it where we show that the force on the ball is always gravity and it's always the same, it's always downwards. Okay. Josie shoots a goal, the ball hits the back of the net with a horizontal speed of 22, the impact makes the net stretch by 15, and the ball has a mass of 160 grams. By considering transfer of energy from the ball to the net, calculate the spring constant of the net. Well, first of all, let's write what we have. Now, in terms of energy transfers, we have the kinetic energy of the ball hitting the net and being converted into elastic potential. The equations for each are half mv squared and half kx squared. So we have the mass, we have the velocity, we want to find the k, so we'll solve for that, and we have the x. So Without further ado, let's solve for k. Now first of all, we can cancel out the halves by dividing both sides by half. Now the only step we need to do now is divide by x squared. I'm also going to flip the equations around, so I have k on this side. And that leaves me with mv squared divided by x squared. If we put our numbers in, And that gives me 3,441.777. Because the question gives us two significant figures, and that's the lowest amount of significant figures, I'm going to write that in two significant figures, which gives me 3,400. 0, 0. And the units of the spring constant are newtons per meter. OK. Josie was 44 metres away from Nicole when Nicole passed the ball to Josie in parts A and B. Will the ball reach Josie before it bounces? Justify your answer using appropriate calculations. So this is pretty much a long-winded way of getting us to figure out the horizontal distance. And to do that, I'm first going to find the time by looking at the vertical motion. Knowing the time, I can then use the horizontal velocity to find the distance using velocity equals distance over time. So anyway, given the equation Vf equals Vi plus At, that's on your former sheet. If we consider the motion of the ball from the ground all the way to the top of its motion, we know that the final velocity in that case is going to be zero. The initial velocity is our VIY that we found in the first question. The acceleration is the acceleration due to gravity. And the time is half the overall time. Now, to solve that for time, I'm going to subtract VIY from both sides. 
and then I'm going to do a few things at once. I'm going to multiply both sides by 2, divide by g, and I'm also going to swap them around. So that gives me that t is equal to negative 2viy divided by g. Putting in our numbers, our viy was 11 meters per second, and our g is negative 9.8. Why is it negative? Well, in this question, I have defined upwards to be positive. You'll note that when I use the initial velocity, the initial velocity is upwards, and so I give it positive 11. Because gravity is downwards, that must be negative. Now, it just so happens that when you do things correctly like that, our negatives cancel out, which leaves us with a positive duration, which is always good. If you ever wind up with a negative duration, chances are you've either made a mistake somewhere or you've blown up the universe. And that gives me 2.245-ish. Rounding that to two significant figures, that gives me 2.2 seconds. Once again, I'm using two significant figures because that's what the question's giving me. Okay, the next step is to find the initial horizontal velocity. And we can do that similarly to how we found the vertical by going 22 and instead of sine, it's cosine times our angle, which is 30 degrees. When we do that, that gives us 19.05, which I'm again going to round to two significant figures. So that's meters per second. Now, an equation you should be all familiar with is Vix is equal to distance over time, one of the most simplest. To rearrange that for our distance, that gives us distance equals Vix times time. If we put in our numbers, that's 19 times 2.2, which gives me 41.8, which I'm going to round to 42 meters. Now in the context of our question, we're asked if the ball bounces before it reaches Josie, who is 44 meters away, and given that it bounces at 42 based on our calculations, the ball bounces 2 meters in front of Josie. Okay. On to question 2. The teams are waiting for the second half of the game. Referee swings her whistle in a horizontal circle. Each rotation takes 1.4 seconds. The metal whistle has a mass of 40 grams and is swung in a circle of radius 0.5 at a constant speed. The first question asks us to show that the speed of the whistle is 2.24 meters per second. That is just a simple matter of velocity equals distance over time. Where our distance is 2 pi r, and our time is our period. Replacing our radius with the actual value, the radius is 0 0.5 meters. And our period is 1.4 seconds. Putting that into our calculator, I indeed get 2.24 meters per second. All right. By determining the horizontal forces on the whistle, explain why it continues to move in a circular motion at a constant speed. Okay, so this here is a typical trap question. What they're cueing you with is the idea that it's moving at a constant speed, and you're somewhat drooled with the idea that constant speed means no net force, and no acceleration, and so everything should be balanced. In this case, of course, that's not the case. We have a centripetal force, which is being provided by the tension, which produces a centripetal acceleration, changing the direction of the speed without changing the magnitude. So let's try put that into words. The whistle experiences a centripetal force provided by the tension. The acceleration of the whistle is towards the center and perpendicular to the velocity. The direction of velocity changes, the magnitude, or speed, does not. And since the question also asks us to determine 
the horizontal forces on the whistle and I've run out of room, I'm going to have to go down to the spare paper. So, to find the centripetal force, we can use the equation that you're given on your formula sheet that the centripetal force is equal to mv squared over our radius r, where the mass is given to us as 0.04 kgs times our velocity, which we figured out in the first question, which is 2.24, don't forget to square it, divided by our radius 0.5, which gives me 0.40 newtons, two, two significant figures. The speed of the whistle is reduced to 1 meters per second. Determine the size of the new horizontal force on the whistle and explain the likely result of reducing the speed on the motion of the whistle. Okay, just like we did in the last question, we use our mv squared over r, where our mass was 0 0.04. Our new velocity is 1, so that's 1 squared, divided by our radius of 0 0.5. Putting that into our calculator gives me 0 0.08 newtons. And so looking at the explained part of this question, reducing the speed of the whistle therefore reduces the tension force. And doing that means that we're going to have the whistle dropping down at a greater angle. Putting this into words, reducing speed reduces the tension. The string will therefore droop down at a greater angle, effectively reducing the radius. Moving on to D. The team is waiting on the sideline, two players sit on the bench as shown. The bench is 1.5 meters long, has a mass of 10 kgs, and each player has a mass of 60. And we're given all of this in a nice little handy diagram, as well as the distances of the players. And we're asked first up to draw labeled arrows showing all the forces acting on the bench. So let's start off with the support forces, which are of course directed upwards. And I'm going to call this FS1, the force of the support 1, and this one FS2, the force of support 2. Both the players exert their gravitational force on the bench, so let's call that F2, and we'll call this F1. And also don't forget that the bench itself has mass, which acts through the center as its own gravitational force. And I'm going to call that FB for bench. Okay, by first determining the torque about point B, calculate the support forces at each end of the bench, and also state what assumptions we have made. All right. So if we take B as a pivot, we basically have one, two, three counterclockwise torques and our one clockwise torque, which is balancing all of those out. So we start with the statement that our torques in the counterclockwise direction equal our torques in the clockwise direction. Our counterclockwise torques are the torque from our bench, we'll call that tau B, plus the torque from our two players, call that tau 2 and tau 1, and they must equal our clockwise torque, which is only our torque from the first support, tau S1. Now let's break that down into the forces and the distances. So the gravitational force on our bench is the mass of the bench times gravity times the distance of the center of the bench, which is half of our 1.5, so that's 0 0.75, let's put that out front, plus our force from our player 2, which is 0 0.6 
meters away, so 0 0.6, that's our distance, times our force, which is the mass of our player 2, times the acceleration due to gravity. Our player 1 is 0 0.25 meters away, and his force is his mass, times the acceleration due to gravity. And that equals our torque from support 1, which has a distance of 1.5, and the force of which we are trying to find. So we're trying to solve for that. So now I'm going to do two things. I'm going to factorize our g out, so I don't have to write it three times. And I'm also going to divide both sides by 1.5. And just for a third thing, I'm also going to swap the sides around, so I end up with Fs1 on the left-hand side. Putting in our numbers. which gives me 382 newtons. Now, to find the force on support 2, because we've found one of our supports, we should consider all of the forces acting and recognize that they should be balanced. So we know the values of all of these forces, and we know that these three forces must be equal and be balanced by these two forces. And hell, I'm going to try and fit that right over here. And since the masses are the same, we can just call them 2m, which I probably should have done earlier. And now putting in our numbers, gives me 8, 9, 2 newtons. And now as for assumptions, it doesn't seem like we're explicitly told that the bench is in equilibrium, so I would personally consider that one of our assumptions. Okay. Question 3. Later in the hockey match, Nicole takes a penalty corner. She hits the stationary ball towards her teammates. State Newton's third law, which refers to the forces during the collision between the ball and Nicole's stick. Well, Newton's third law, of course, states that every force is accompanied by an equal and opposite force. So in the context of the stick and the ball, Nicole's stick applies a force to the ball, and the ball applies an equal and opposite force to the stick. When hitting the stationary ball for the penalty corner, Nicole hits with a stick velocity of 18 meters per second. After hitting the ball, the stick continues forwards at 12 meters per second. The mass of the stick is 600 grams, and the mass of the ball is 160 grams. Calculate the velocity of the ball, and also it wants us to explain the assumptions that are made in our calculation. And the assumption we'll of course make is that momentum is conserved. So this is a collision problem. We can consider the stick and the ball as just two objects which have an initial velocity, collide, and then finish off with some final velocity. When we look at their momentums, we will assume that they equal. And via that, we should get a handy equation which should let us calculate the velocity of the ball. So the initial momentum is equal to the final momentum. Now given that the ball is initially stationary, the only initial momentum comes from the stick, which is traveling at 18 meters per second. 
momentum of the stick initially. The final momentum is from both the ball and the stick because they both have velocities. The velocity of the stick is 12 and the velocity of the ball is what we're trying to find. Momentum of the stick final plus momentum of the ball final. Breaking that down into mass and velocities. And now solving for VBF, which is what we're of course trying to find. To do that, I'm going to subtract MSVSF from both sides. And now I'm going to do three things. I'm going to factorize MS out, so I only have to write it once rather than twice. I'm going to swap the sides around so that I end up with VBF on this side. And I'm also going to divide by mass. Try to keep up. Now I just need to put the numbers in. Where you must remember to write the masses in their kilogram equivalents. which gives me 22.5 and since the question gives me two significant figures I'm going to round that to 23. Okay. Goalkeepers are heavily protected including the use of leg guards as shown. Uh, unfortunately the images are of course not supplied. <laughs> The ball has a mass of 160 grams, it's shot towards the goal, but hits the goalkeeper's leg guards instead. The ball has an initial velocity of 30, the time of the impact is 0.02, it rebounds with a velocity of 10 meters per second. Calculate the average force of the impact, which is going to be a bit of a process. So to find the force, we're going to need to use the equation force equals the impulse or change in momentum divided by the duration where we have the time of the impact here which means we just need to find our change in momentum to find the change in momentum we just need to consider the mass of the ball and its change in velocity so the change in momentum is equal to the final momentum minus the initial momentum where the final momentum is the mass times the final velocity and the initial momentum is the mass times the initial velocity factorizing this so that we only need to write our mass once and putting in our numbers, converting 160 grams to kgs. Now a trap that is very easy to fall into is to write both of these velocities as the same polarity. So both positive or, well, both negative if you like. Because these velocities are in the opposite direction, so the ball is coming in one way and then goes away in the opposite direction, we need to make one of these negative. So because I like positive numbers more than I do negative numbers, I'm going to make the initial velocity negative. So we're going to have negative 30, which of course turns this whole thing here into a plus. So when we calculate that, I get 6.4 kg meters per second. Okay, so now we both know the change in momentum and we know the duration. Now it's just a matter of plugging those numbers in. Which gives me 320 newtons. 
All right, the graph below shows the force of impact over time when no leg guards are worn. Add a second graph to the diagram to show the effect that the leg guards would have on the graph shape. So the whole idea of wearing padding is to increase this time. And when you increase this time and keep the, the impulse, the change in momentum the same, you are reducing this force, which means the graph would end up looking something like this. And so the force is going to be less and the time is going to be longer and the change in momentum, which happens to be the area, is going to be the same. Okay, justify your answer by using physics principles to explain how the leg guards benefit the goalkeeper. The cushioning of the guards increases the collision duration. Since the impulse is the same, via force equals change in impulse over change in time, the force must decrease. And that's it.